now then everybody and welcome back to the latest episode of the to hull and back podcast um i'm joined today by usual i don't know what what will's name's all about there but we're joined by will and uh nathaniel uh, he's ukrainian also, you philistine well i don't know languages will i'm just gonna it would have been bad for me to just assume what language it was um and then I mean, also we've got it can be really looking at the language is there <laughs> yeah true That's all right guys <laughs> Uh, we've also joined by uh, John Ozzel, uh, the South Stand superstar. Uh, how are you today, John? I'm all right, thank you. A bit worse for wear after yesterday, but not too bad. Yeah, uh, and then obviously we are joined by um, Hull Live correspondent uh, Barry Cooper again. Nice to have you back on, Baz. Hello, folks. Thank you for having me. Sorry it's been a while. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so before we get into it, obviously this episode is sponsored by uh, Candy King, uh, the Hull-based sweets business Uh Obviously, they will deliver to Hull and surrounding areas. Uh, very good prices on sweets. Um, please order them because I can't keep buying them all because um, <laughs> I'm putting on a lot of weight. Um, I like sweets, particularly milk bottles. Ah, well, message them. They might, they might sort you out. They've got a special offer on, free for 25, three kilograms. You reckon you could do three kilograms, Baz? Oh, crikey, no, no problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> also, a 12 hour flight coming up this week, so uh, that'd be quite handy. Well, there you go. Head to the website, check them out. Um, also sponsored by uh, Six Yards Out that do uh, retro memorabilia. You can, you can put like retro kit designs and CFAX results on coasters, mugs, uh, film papers, and things like that. I like coasters cool. as well. Yeah, so you can you can get your favourite kit design. You can get the Tiger Print mug if you wanted. You know, if you're feeling it. Um, very good prices. Got four point two stars out of five on. Um, uh, Trust Pilot, so you know you're getting good quality with them. So do head over and check them out. And then obviously we have still got the. Um, the charity podcast shirts that are doing very well at the minute. We've raised, I think, over £150. And I'm yet to get the latest total altogether. But we are nearly, we're approaching the £200 mark raised for Andy, Andy's Man Club through them. So thanks to everybody who has bought them. They should be with you by the end of next week. Uh, I have been told uh, for the vast majority of those of you that's ordered. Uh, so if you haven't, do head to the link tree and, and, and order one. Uh, it would help us and the charity out a lot. Right, um, straight into it then. So I've been told that I'm not allowed to talk about the Barnsley game. Uh, and it's probably the best because <laughs> it wouldn't be a very nice uh, listen, I don't think. Obviously, um, a, a very bad performance, very bad result. Uh, You've already ago. said too much. <laughs> already gone. It's too much wow. detail. Let, let, it, let it go, Anne. I can't let it go. It's in the past now. It's in the pain to get the pleasure we got yesterday. So I'll How can you not be over it after yesterday? Do you know what? The worst thing about it was is that I was just going to have a nice, relaxed night watching that game on telly. Um, I contemplated taking the little one, but it was too late, so I decided not to. What a and shame! Then I got you went in the got... ground, <laughs> <laughs> and then I got roped into uh, doing a live watch along of the game, oh, doing the whole city perspective. Awful. So yeah, it was really fun for me to sit there mm. and say, "Yeah, we've done absolutely nothing for ninety minutes." But yeah, so enough of that. We played very bad. We lost, but obviously a very good result. Uh, we've just been to Peterborough, uh, obviously managed by uh, former city manager Grant McCann. Very convincing result, very good result. I think probably puts us in the towards the safe confines. I'm, I'm pretty confident now that we're not going to get roped into a bottom three fight after that game. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, John. Did you go to the game? I did go to the game, yeah. My first away game for a couple of years since COVID. So, yeah, ah. well, worth it. well worth it. Right then, so I'll come to you first then. So, do you, do you what what went well against Peterborough then? What was the difference that that you know we didn't we didn't see in the in the previous game? What what why were we so convincing against Posh as compared to the Barnsley game? Well, we went we went back to the formation that's been suited to us since November. Um, four three three just don't work with our players, but from what we're looking at, you know, we don't make any chances at all. I I watched the game and even even though I've read for the first ten minutes they were on top. To be fair. Usually when you go away, you go for long spells, don't you, where you were, you know, home team are pressing and, and putting a bit of pressure on. I don't think there was any time in the whole game where they've got any pressure on us at all. And as soon as we scored, we were just by far the better team. So, it was great. Yeah. So, do you think then, because um, it's interesting to see your perspective of it, Baz. Um, do you think then, or did you or did you always have an inkling that uh, when Shotter was coming in, that he was always going to change to the 4-3-3 system? Because obviously we'd seen our better games this season have been with the three at the back system. So it was, we always had that sort of worry that when McCann was manager, that when he got an available right back fit again, that he would also resort back to it. But then with the change in manager, and we, we found out that his preferred formation is the 4-3-3. Three, three. 
Uh, was it always on the cards to go back to that system, or do you think this might have changed his mind now? I think it was always in his mind to, to go back to a four because he, like Grant, he likes the four three three. Uh, but what I would say is, the players have spoken throughout the season about the, the feeling more comfortable playing a three. Now, you have to be adaptable within each system, of course you do. But I also think you have to listen to your players, and if the players are saying, "Look, Gaffer, we, you know, we." Um, we feel better. We we feel more comfortable with that with that system. The results back it up. If you, I mean, I haven't got the stats to hand, but if you look at the stats of when they when City have played with a three compared with when they played with a four, you know the the, the, the wins far far outweigh anything else with a three. And even when Grant kind of had to go to a three against Middlesbrough way back when, uh, we won two 0 and yeah, we didn't play great. Uh, and you'd probably say that Borough were, were, were arguably better, but we won the game 2-0 um, with a three. And I remember, I think it was Deshaun Bernard came out after the game and said, you know, we felt more comfortable. And was somebody, I think it was Greaves, he also said in the week as well, before the next game about it. And Grant got really prickly about the formation, about the changing, and he had to stick with it for a bit owing to personnel. Um, but when he went back to a four, we, we it didn't... There's been one or two occasions. I know at Barnsley we played a four, but um, away from home. But I think I think generally the players look look better, and I think Shotter uh, is getting to grips with with the level and you know the players he's got is disposable is disposed, I should say. And when you see the performance they delivered at Peterborough with a three, um, it's a, but again we can waffle on about formations, but it's about having the, the right players in the right areas as well. And I think that was the key yesterday. He got, he actually got, the setup was, was decent compared that with Barnsley the, the, on Tuesday night and the shambles at Derby a couple of weeks prior to Barnsley. You know, he did, he got his setup all wrong and not only was the formation a bag of nails, but so too was the, the players that got in those positions. Yeah. I mean, from, from, from my opinion, like, and, and like we said, the, the players themselves have said, this squad, has always, from the beginning of the season, when back when McCann was manager, fans were calling for it. I think the three at the back just suits the personnel that we've got. I think the four-three-three isolates the defensive midfielder too much, and if you put two of them there, then we don't have enough offensive threat, which I think we've seen in the last few games under Shotter, where we're not really creating chances and, and we're just kind of defending for ninety minutes. And the, th the three at the back allows our quite you know comfortable on the ball, progressive uh, ball playing centre halves like Greaves and. Bernard, Alfie Jones as well, who's, who's, who's not there. Uh, he's superb yeah. on the ball, you know. Yeah, and McLaughlin as well, who's been probably one of the biggest revelations of this season and, and, and probably quite a steady head at the back, um, you know, because considering the amount of game time that he's had overall, you wouldn't have expected him to come in and have the impact that he has. And it's a very young defence and it definitely brings the best out of all three of them when, when we've got that situation, well, all four, depending on which combination three you've got. Uh, but it also, I think, lessens the, the the burden of the midfielders. So you can play like Smallwood there, you can play Slater or Doherty alongside them, and, and it gives us a good balance between defence and uh, attacking threat. So, I mean, I think one of the biggest um, uh, questions that's going to come from this then, uh, and I'll come to you, Nathaniel, when it comes to playing the wing-backs then, because obviously we're not blessed with many striking options at the minute. Um, obviously, I think, because... For example, if Louis Coyle comes back from injury, we've seen at Derby that maybe as a wing back he's he's, he's not got the uh, necessary um, ability to, to do a wing back role. Um, and then you look at the likes of Ryan Longman, who's who's more offensive, but you might lose that defensive side of things. But we've seen our best times as like you know KLP and Longman as the wing backs, but then Brandon Fleming's coming to the side. Do we do we put um, Fleming and let's we'll say Louis Coyle comes back fit? Do you think he'll play him as a wing back or do you think we'll go back to a back four? Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Coyle played right back or right wing back at Derby uh, and that didn't exactly go very well. I think Fleming is definitely a shoe in uh, at left wing back because not only is, you know, well, he's only our, well, Elder had been out, but out of the two left backs we have, you'd definitely play Fleming. So you'd have him in there. And his strength is certainly dribbling forward and, and attacking. But on the right hand side, I mean, you know, two months ago, it would have been Longman because he was in top form. But, you know, he was dropped. Uh, you know, it pains me to say it, but deservedly so because he didn't play well against the team that won't be named on Tuesday. Um, so it's a difficult one because you could play Slater there, who did really well on Saturday. Or you play Coyle, uh, who you know uh, 
maybe he's, he's not a proper winger, but I think crossing especially, he's really good at that. So having him going forward is useful, but it's, it's a really difficult choice. Uh, but, you know, I know it was Peterborough who aren't that great, but um, I mean, Schotter in his interviews has said that uh, he doesn't ne necessarily care who plays so long as whoever is playing does well. So I think Slater deserves to stay in that position uh, as long as the performances are kept up like on Saturday. Yeah, I think, think, think Longman's been very. I think Longman's looked tired for about two or three games. Yeah, I think a rest is needed because since, since he signed permanently, he's not been involved as much. Yeah, he uh, does seem in, a little, in the game. He definitely doesn't seem his his old self. I, I think. Yeah. And he wing don't, back he is a willing. tiring role. Yeah, it is it is. He's a young um, lad as well. He's a young lad, so you know, yeah, he's, never, he's, not played, he's not played it you know consistently before at this level. It's a big ask to, to, to do it week in yeah. week out. So just to check him out and shield him a little bit and bring him back in. I, no problem with that. Slater did a good job yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because we, we, we've definitely, because I was, was going to say the thing is, is who do you play in the right wing back role? But obviously Slater did it and did it well against Peterborough. I think the first half, he was fantastic. He may be quieting down a bit in the second, but in, in, he definitely showed that he can do that role if asked. Uh, my question would have been, obviously, if, if we're dropping Lomond, who we play in there instead of? So obviously Slater would be an option, but then... Um, in midfield, we'd, we'd have to play then uh, Smallwood and Doherty, wouldn't we, alongside Honeyman? Um, well, do you think then, um, when it comes to our striking options, do you think we've seen enough from uh, Marcus Force and Tyler Smith to suggest that we've got enough goals in us to, to really push away from that bottom three for the rest of the season? It's hard to say because the last few games we've been playing... We've not really created enough up front to give them chances. I mean, when they have had chances, you could argue they've not done the right thing in terms of like Tyler Smith against the team that may not be named. Um, but Force, when he's had a chance, for the most part, has done all right when he's actually had a chance in front of the goal. I mean, his goal at QPR was a decent finish. Um, it's hard to say, really. We need a couple of games playing in the back three again, I think, seeing what that. I think Tyler Smith and KLP were great together um, yesterday. I thought they were superb up front as a partnership, and I think that's probably what we'll see on the regular going forward, honestly. Mm. I hope so, because one, yeah. one of my bugbears has been KLP's just been so far wide. Even when he was meant to be playing with Eves, he just drifts to that left, and he was just leaving it. Eves isolated and, and forced. And the problem we've got is I don't think Strikers might not be the top level or whatever, but we're expecting them to, to score with the one chance they're getting in the whole game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's too much to ask for. I'm watching that game today and like Lukaku's missing a chance, you know, and stuff like that. So we can't expect them just to score every single chance they get. The problem mm -hmm. is we don't make enough chances to not highlight that's that. That's it. But we, we do with three at the back. Players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do need scale for the Yeah. Uh, Forsh hasn't had a chance in a front two yet. And I think, I, I still believe that given chances, he'll score a lot because, you know, he's uh, he's probably on paper the best striker we've got in terms of his record. So, um, you know, maybe give him a chance at, up top. But I just feel for Smith a little bit because he's, he's scored against Peterborough. We won. And then now Eves, Syed Manesh and Forsh are all going to be back for the next game. So he, even though he scored, he probably won't play. He should. I, think I was going to say, I wouldn't change it. Thing. If you're a striker and you score, you play the next game. It should just be as simple as that. Yeah, the problem that the problem City have had is that, like Tyler's been. I, I actually think he's got something about him, um, and I think he's worth mm. persevering with. But the problem we've had is that he's not played for weeks and weeks and weeks. He then comes off the bench when you're chasing the game or you're trying to get whatever you're trying to get back into it, trying to, and you're you're expecting him to come in cold and, and hit the ground running, and then he starts a game, and again we're expecting strikers. Strikers thrive on rhythm um, and playing regular, and I think to, to expect Tyler, who's let's be fair, hasn't played a huge, you know, he's played over hundred games out on loan and stuff, but he's not played a huge amount of football, um, and and certainly he hasn't got that continuity that strikers that strikers thrive upon, as I say. And I think if you can give Tyler a bit of time up front, um, you might start to see the potential. I thought. I actually thought he reacted really well on, on against Peterborough because he missed. There was a, a wonderful move down the left hand side, and Fleming, um, as he so often does, you know, wins the ball high up and he gets in. He gets to the byline, mm. 
shots back. And I thought at that point, Smith was a bit hesitant, caught on his heels and he should have darted across the near post, across his man, uh, but didn't. But then a couple of moments later, obviously he did. And that's that's where the first goal come from. And I thought, or came from, I should say, and I thought he, he looked he looked better. I was a bit surprised after the Everton game, actually, when he got such a, he scored a really, really good goal there. But he didn't kick on. But again, in and out of the team, in a struggling team that's struggling for goals, not creating a huge amount. And we always look to the strikers as the ones to get us out of these holes. And, you know, it's difficult when they're not playing regularly, and certainly in a team that are creating chances. So maybe, and I think he will start on Saturday. I think Shotter is, 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 is good like that. I don't think he'll make too many changes. I think he'll stick with Tyler because he knows as a striker himself, or as a former striker, how important that rhythm is uh, and that confidence that comes with, with scoring goals. Mm. Um, I'll come to you, John, because I'm interested in this one. Because I think, obviously, Shot has not had that many games in charge, um, so it's it's very very harsh to judge. Um, obviously, so so after only what seven games, is it um, whether or not he's, he's going to be a, su- a success here? Because he's inherited, let's be honest, like you know, a Grant McCann slash Allen sort of mess. Uh, he hasn't really had chance to get the players that he, he probably you know. I, I don't think many of these will have been his first choice transfer targets I think a few of them we missed out on because obviously we didn't have that long to get players in but do you think that because obviously you go every week at, to the home games anyway um do you, do you think it's weird that we've kind of I know Tom Eves got injured and had to get dropped um but do you think that it's strange that we kind of sort because we played so such attractive short snappy football against Swansea and then it kind of just vanished and we kind of have resorted to hitting it long and 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 from what I've seen of Force, he doesn't look like he's a hold-up striker, and it seems like, well, for 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 the at the moment anyway. Obviously, given injuries, it might be different, but it seems like we've signed players and then played a system that doesn't suit them. Uh, would you agree? I think it's I think it's really difficult to judge yet, and I think we shouldn't judge too early. As long as we stay up this season, I think with all the players out of contracts, kind of in the summer. I don't expect many of them to, to get new contracts now because they'll want his own team and he's playing with someone else's team. So we obviously, we needed strikers. He brought he brought uh, Alleyway in, he brought in Force. Um, obviously one of them has been injured. Force isn't going to be the hold-up man, but we didn't have much choice when he was playing up there. We, we just didn't play the right balls to him, basically, against Lanza, who we shouldn't be naming. So I don't know... That we have get, we're so inconsistent, but we've been we've, the team has been inconsistent all season. Now, whether that's a lack of quality or a lack of experience at this level, we go through spells where we look decent, and we, we have a game like Stoke game under McCann where we just look completely off the off it. So it's hard to judge the new manager. It was a, it was a really difficult time for him to come in after the, the run of form we'd been on, and I think that kind of crested the wave on his first game and it helped him. But he's going to have to work out the players as well. He doesn't know the players really, so. Yeah, it's just a difficult one to judge. I'd give him to the end of the season, let him bring his own players in and then see where we are at Christmas if we were looking to push on or at least mid-table. I think we'd be, but I think we'd be good enough if we had three or four players. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the distance between us and the bottom three is quite significant at the minute. And mm-hmm. you're looking at what... Uh, I know Barnsley seems to have picked up form at the minute. Uh, Deep Borough as well, didn't they? 3-2. And uh, Derby looked like they had the minerals to stay up, but they've kind of fell off it a bit lately. And... Reading yeah. looked down as well. They don't look Reading, the books there. Yeah, Reading and Peterborough probably don't look like they're the ones that would claw themselves out of danger. But the other two, you could potentially think, you know, maybe, maybe they'd put a run together. But, you, you know, a 13, 14 point deficit is quite quite a big deficit to uh, re- recuperate in the championship, especially when you're down in the bottom, bottom four. Um, so I think we'll be okay, personally. But I just think that, you know, and understandably so. I mean, like, you know, the fans, when... They replaced McCann. It was based on the on the premise that we was going to get you know on the front foot, aggressive, attacking, um, forward thinking football kind of thing. And and maybe given the, the the opposition that we had, you know, like QPR and Sheffield United, that are teams up in the chasing playoffs, that understandably we, we we kind of parked the bus a bit. But then when you look at the games where Derby, for example, and um, uh, the the team in red that we shouldn't mention, um, that we probably should have picked results up from, but didn't, and it it. it, it I don't know. Understandably, from a fan's perspective, you're going to have a little bit of you know worry in that sense. But like we say, you know, he's inherited a team that he didn't really have anything to do with, and and which we, we will probably see the real shot of Avaladzi all City next season when he's when he's had a full preseason and a, and a summer transfer window. Um, do you think so? I'll come to you then, Baz, because there's quite a few players out of contract. I'm not sure if you know them off by heart, 
Um, realistically, how many do you think he's going to be looking at keeping or who do you think he's going to let go? So, so there's eight out of contract that have all got options. Um, I, asked, I I had a, a sit down with Tan Kessler on Thursday at the MKM uh, and that was one of the things I put to him um, about, the, about the contracts. And basically he said that uh, it's down to the current player. He wants to be fair to the current the players that are there um, that, have, that have obviously got the club promoted and stay relatively stable in the championship and it's basically up to up to those players to to earn their their, their deals obviously they've all got option years so is it a case of they activate all eight uh, and say look we're going to give you a, we're, we're going to give you an option year um you've earned it type of thing i personally i would be surprised if that was the case I haven't asked sh show to this a few, quite a few times now He's sort of been vague-ish that maybe six stay and two go and five and three. I, I still think it's a bit up in the air. The obvious one is 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 George, uh, and there's a there's a will from both sides there to to get something thrashed out. So I don't think that will be a particular problem. Um, I, I, I do actually think there's one or two that have surprised them. I think Richie Smallwood has surprised them. I, I think that. Um, and I'm basing this not on conjecture. I'm basing this on conversations I had with uh, Adjun and, and, and his folks months and months ago before he bought the club. Um, and I think that Richie was as, as genuinely surprised them um, the importance that he is he has in the team. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if he was uh, given an option year. Conversely, I wouldn't all equally. I wouldn't be surprised if he was looking to, to go and get the security of a contract elsewhere. So I think. There will be players, Smallwood, uh, potentially Tom Eaves, that are offered option years, but prefer to seek it elsewhere. Where they, like Josh McGuinness did, you know, the option, mm. of, the offer of two or three years elsewhere at their stages of careers. I think that they're more likely to move on elsewhere. Um, mm. Tom, uh, you know, we've spoken Tom to Tom. Yeah, I've spoken to Tom last. <laughs> Say again, sorry. Tom Alderson, I didn't think would would will will be renewed. We haven't time. needed him really. No, no, I, I would agree with that, and I think going forward, you're probably going to sign better younger players. That said, there is a there is an an accept an ex, sorry an acceptance within the club that they need experience. Uh, I think they regret maybe not doing something with one or two other players in the summer and and January as well. But yeah, I, I, it's a watch this space, isn't it? But I, I think they they will be. Try and be fair to the players that, that are out of contract, um, and um, you know. But I think it'll, a lot of it will depend on what the players want to do. Do you think yeah. it depends on the on the budget, Matt? Because no one really knows what the budget's going to be with the Turkish ones. So yeah, a lot of money. Then obviously we move people on and get better players. But if there's not that much money available, we might keep these players. Yeah, that's a fair point, and I think I think it's widely accepted that the budget. Currently, under the Alam regime, was was bottom three in the, in the division. Um, depending on who you speak to, Grant will tell you it was the bottom of the league, and you speak to the club, and they'll tell you, well, it wasn't bottom of the league, but it was lower 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 table. Uh, you know, the, 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 what I, what I've been told by um, a Jun, a Jun's side is that the, the the budget next season will be significantly improved. Um, we're not, I'm not you know, yes, it's going to be top two, top three, top four, because obviously City aren't going to be, financially cannot compete with uh, the teams that are coming down from the Premier League. That goes without saying. There's, there's there's very few teams in the Championship that can because of the parachute situation. So that's, that's obvious. But I would suspect that uh, budget-wise, they're going to be you know pushing top 10, if not slightly higher, possibly top six. But it all depends on, you know, who comes down, who... Who of the teams pushing for promotion at the minute don't don't get promoted? Um, obviously, if Bournemouth don't go up, you know, their budget is massive, ridiculous. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one, but it, it, it will be it will be a, a lot lot higher than it is now. Let's, let's, we can we can certainly say that. Mm. Do you think? Um, I, know, I know we're kind of hogging you at the minute, Buzz, but do you think? Um, Keen Lewis Potter, Jacob Greaves, obviously reported interest from West Ham at the minute, Premier League, understandably so. Uh, you know, two young, bright talents. Um, do you think realistically we're going to keep hold of them in the summer? Um, Greaves, realistically, yes, I think so. Uh, KLP, no, not a chance. I would, um, I would be very surprised if, if Keen Lewis Potter is a whole city player 
come the first game of next season. There's a lot of interest in him. There was in January. Um, I think he will go. But what I would say is that is that isn't. A, I don't think City fans should obviously be disappointed because he's a local boy. He's, he's got. A, he's a terrific talent. But the reality of the piece is City. Um, he wants to play in the Premier League, um, and City can't offer him Premier League football right now, and, and and certainly until this time next season potentially if everything goes well. So, and even then there's no guarantee. So, um, but what I would say is that if he does go, there's going to be a, a fair amount of money coming into the football club, which is needed. Um, even with the wealthiest of owners, you still need to to keep your club, you know, sustainable. And and, and if that money is reinvested, which I've been told, should he go? Uh, that money would be, you know, reinvested back into the squad, and so you know, it's not ideal, is it? Because you want to keep your best players, but you also can't stand in the player's way that knows he's going to, he can, he can go and play in the Premier League, and uh, it just, it's just about making sure that if he does go, it's the right fit for him that he's going to further his career, um, and for City getting the right amount of recompense and being able to invest that in the right areas. Mm. So that that actually surprised me a little bit. I thought you'd say maybe at least until January, because. I think I would imagine, obviously, that Ajahn's seen the importance of needing to recruit players that can score goals for this team. I know he's came out and said that he wants to invest heavily in a striker in summer, definitely. Um, so, for me, to invest heavy in a striker, but then lose Keane Lewis Potter, loses another source of goals, which I think, you know, obviously, like every player has his price. If someone comes and pays a silly amount of money, then you can understand it, but... Given what he said in January, you know, where he said even if they'd offered 20 million, he'd said no. Um, do, you, do you think that that means that he's going to lower his, his his demand come summer? Or do you think that there is realistically a team that's going to put a massive outlay on? Because I know West Ham like their young attacking wingers that came and took Bowen off and look how well he's doing. But they have got, you know, Saeed Benrahma, they've, they've got Yamalenko, Bowen. They've, they've, got a, they've got a nice, healthy plethora of attacking wingers at their club so it surprises me that you that you know teams like them would be coming in for him the the, the, the thing here for, for for Keane is to go to a club that he's he's got a realistic chance of of playing and I know that I know Keane is is very level-headed the people around him are very level-headed and are focused on his career they're not interested in making and I know you might scoff at this fans will about agents because they think all agents are sharks and out for their own interest but Keane's people are very very grounded um want the best for his career and I think he will only go to a club where he has a genuine chance of playing uh week in week out you look at the example a good example I think is Jack Clark at Leeds United uh mm -hmm. was when, when Leeds were, were in the championship and were, Jack Clark was, was was one of the highly rated championship players at that time got a big move to Spurs uh, never played and is now on loan at Sunderland uh, and has, been, has bounced around a bit. And I think Keane, Keane's folks are very, very wary of, of that being the case, that he, he could go to a West Ham, he could go to a Tottenham, but let's be fair, with, and Keane is, is a brilliant talent, he isn't going to get anywhere near their first team, either West Ham or, or Tottenham at this stage. So he's going to be back in the 23s and his career will stagnate. And before you know it, he's, he's back in League One playing somewhere, um, and his career's gone backwards. Yeah, he's got a whack in the bank, but that doesn't. Not all players, believe it or not, are focused on filling the bank accounts. A lot of mm. most players actually just want to play football every week and play at the highest level they can. So, um, I think in Tim, coming back to what you asked what asked about in, in the summer, I think you know there's Keane's contract is 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 getting is, is coming down in t in terms of time. Um, you know, if, if he was to stay, like you suggest, to next January, then there's that his value decreases to the club mm. because I would I would find it unlikely that he, they'd be able to agree a new contract because ultimately the player wants to go and play in the Premier League. Um, so I think there's an acceptance from the club and also from from Keane Lewis Potter that come the summer there's a discussion to be had and depending on what the the financials are from the club, the buying club, i.e. Brentford, because they they were the team that. They were the only team in January that put cold, harsh, cold hard cash down on the table and said, we want Keane Lewis Potter. West Ham wanted him. Uh, Tottenham wanted him, but it never got to a stage where they either of those placed money on the table, if you like. Um, and the Brentford package was very attractive, as I understand it. So 
it's a case of let's see in the summer um but from the, the kids point of view i asked him i asked him last i spoke to him after the game yesterday and um he reiterated his his his, his you know his desire to stay at the football club and help Hull city but you know i think there's going to be movement in the summer on that and I, I don't think anybody should should be under any illusions that that is a deal that is likely to get done at some point yeah so it's more of a Adrian understands that he's not going to stand in his way kind of thing if you want Kane comes to him and says look this team promising me that i'm going to play quite regularly will you let me go and Adrian will say yeah fair play go for it yeah because look you know he's not going to want uh, and I mean, I don't mean any any disrespect to, here to Keane at all because he's a great kid, um, and he's our talisman, and he's he's a wonderful talent, and he loves playing football. Um, and he, 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 yeah. But if he wants to go and play, if he wants to go elsewhere and play in the Premier League with a, a club that are offering to to you know to make him to financially look after him, but more importantly, give him first team football and a realistic chance of playing first team in football in the Premier League. Then you can't stand in the players' way. We have to separate ourselves as supporters from this notion that players, you know, even even our local players, fans of the club, want to stay at that club indefinitely. There's very very few situations like a Jack Grealish at Villa, and look how that ended up. And I think I just hope that City fans can can understand that that Keane is a, a passionate boy about this football club, about this city. Um, but a footballer's career is short-lived. It's so short-lived. And when the opportunity comes to come and play at the top level and potentially get yourself into England reckoning, you know, it, the Championship isn't that. Um, certainly the bottom end of the Championship. And like, yes, I know we've got aspirations to be at the top of the Championship and get promoted. But from Keane's point of view, this is an offer that's there now. You know, not in two or three years' time. I think he's given the club good service in the time that he's been here. Um, and I think he'd be hard-pushed to be grudging the opportunity. Yeah, true. You was about to ask something, John? I was just going to say, I think as a, as a club, we've got to be realistic, really, because if, you, if you're going to get to any... What, what, what have we got our youth system for? We've got our youth system to bring our own players through. And like every other club in the Championship, we're going to sell them for big money. Mm -hmm. That's how football clubs run. And yeah. we're not Man City. We're never going to be Man City. So we're always going to have to sell our best players. It's about maximising the price you get for them. So if you if someone offered 20 million for King Lewis Brock this summer, I would sell it for because what you can do then is you can in, you can even if it's half you know if you just invest half of it or a quarter of it we can we could buy some good players for five seven mm -hmm. million pounds at this level you know that make our team stronger mm -hmm. for one player and this is what it's all about we this if there's, if there's one thing that the Allens did well it's it's improving our youth system because all of a sudden yeah, we're just providing youth players that were at League One and League Two level that we just released and they went and played for Grimsby. Suddenly we've got these players coming through that can actually start in the championship. Fleming, Greaves, KLP. And then that's where we need to look to, to sell them on. And that, that's how the business should be run. And I know we're fans and we don't want that to happen, but that's just the truth of it, really. John, you, mm -hmm. John, you're absolutely spot on. And I think that's a valid point. That Look, even Man City had to sell Ferran Torres to Barcelona. Um, you know, There's no club out there that, that can survive without, you know, player transfers that's why it's the biggest you know that's why that's all we ever talk about that's all fans are interested in it's the currency that makes football go round is, is player transfers because you're not in, you know okay covid is, is, is has had an impact and so therefore ffp has, has maybe been slightly relaxed and what have you but ultimately clubs cannot rely on the ownership alone you know that's not a healthy place to be look at that Look, look at the situation at Derby. So heavily reliant on on their owner to buy him, you know, to buy get him out of the hole. Um, in theory, as they were in, um, you know, City City are fortunate, and it's it's worth stressing the point for all the criticisms of the Alams and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, we don't need to go open that kind of worms again. But they have left financially the football club in a very very good place. Um, if it wasn't in a good place. We wouldn't be sat here now having this conversation about Adrian Illigella because he would not have bought the football club had mm -hmm. it not been in the financial state that it is. Yeah. So this, the club have, are on a sound financial footing, um, and because of that, we're able to turn down, you know, eight million pounds in the summer for KLP and ten or twelve in, in January for, for, from Brentford for him again, um, and other interesting Greaves and one or two other footballers at the, at the, at the club. So. Um, but ultimately, you've got to sell to survive, and that is for pretty much every club in the championship. If you get a, a good player coming through, the, the, the top clubs in the Premier League, 
are going to are going to come and get them. And even if City, let's be fair, even if City were were, were, were ten points clear at the top and were going up, there'd still be a very good chance that Pete Lewis Potter would would go and play, you know, for a team higher up in the Premier League. You, That's you, what happened with Carvalho at Fulham, almost. Yeah, exactly. In reality, you have to understand that. Um, that's the way it goes, and these these players want to go and play for the really, really top top football clubs in the country, and um, and under the top managers. And I think, it, while it would be it would be hard to see KL, KLP go and play play for another team, you've only got to look at the impact that Jared Bowen's having at West at West, at West Brom then, at West Ham, and he's realistically going to be in the English squad next month. Mm. And, it's, and, it, and it's mixed it's secure as a club for the next three years. That that transfer, like the Jared Bowen transfer. Took us through COVID. It, it makes you secure as a club. Yeah. Yeah. You know you're going to lose money as a football club. You need you need to make it up. Yeah, and you can reinvest that, like you say, John. Again, good, great point. You know, even and I think Nathaniel said this as well that even if you, you you say let's say we got I don't know let's pluck a figure out of thin air. This is I'm literally plucking fourteen million for KLP. Even if you said half of that, so seven million pounds was going to go to the manager to to strengthen for seven million pounds, you can get decent players at this level. Ten million. Yeah, and that that money, some of that money's banked, and even if you put, um, you know, half a million pound of that to walk back into the academy to fund the academy for the next season and find the next KLP, and City are in a really fortunate position. They've got good young players coming through from all ages. So K KLP isn't the. It's not like well, we sell KLP and that's the end. We may as well shut the academy down and that's the end of it. You know, th th there's a there's a stream of talent there, and you have to invest in that in that academy process to get the next one and get the next one and get the next one. And I think we've seen that. I mean, you look at the youngsters that are coming through um, in in a couple that have been given first team opportunities this season. We we still look like we've got a few players that are going to come through and make quite an impact. And like we say, as as, as much as we'd we'd love King Lewis Potter to stay, uh, realistically, when he goes, it's going to help. You know, like we say, invest in possibly a, a mid table slash promotion push next season. Um, you got to look, and we've still got cracking players like Jacob Greaves, Brandon Fleming that that will be playing for us. And it's and not like. It's not like January when we sold Bowen. I know yeah. we sold Grzyk as well, but we didn't really have many other good players on that team because yeah. they were absolutely dire without them. Whereas also, if when we, we were... In, when we look back in hindsight, those two transfers, are, it's like a completely different situation because Bowen, I think, stayed six months longer than we expected him to. Well, yeah, uh, we should have sold him in the summer so we didn't have to panic buy. Yeah. So yeah. we could do that this summer, you know, and actually have the money to spend on better players. It's the important That's... investment of that transfer window is the massive important reinvestment. We've got the money for Bowen and Grzycki, replacing with Samuelson and Madison. Mm. And <laughs> not not <Yeah>. good. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think I think the Allens at the time were. I, I keep hearing that oh, we're going to do a Brentford, we're going to do a Brentford, but Brentford spend five six million on a player. And they do it. Yeah, they spend a lot. Million. It's not like they nothing. The model works. I know, I know Sky Sports rave about them every time they're on TV and tell us their model because that's what Sky do. Uh, mentioning something like um, what Brentford do is they analyse teams that are overperforming in their league and then sign their best players for cheap and then sell them on for massive profit and then find somebody equally as good. Like, you know, they, mm -hmm. they sold Ollie Watkins and found out Ivan Turney, for example. That that kind of like-for-like -like replacement is, is perfect in terms of a club model because it, it brings you success and also brings you money at the same time, whilst also churning out, you know, young players. And, and you just got to have the scouting system for it, don't you? I mean, I've got full confidence in the fact that adjun has got a lot of contacts in sport. I know, especially over in the Turkish league, for example. But I, th I think recruitment-wise in the summer, I think we're going to do quite well. I'm quite excited for it. I don't know what everybody else is feeling about it. Well, well he's um, promised big money on a striker. So yeah, definitely. That's a dream. Intrigued. Can mm. you give us any exclusives, Baz? Do you know? Do you know who he's after? Your mouth. I think I think what I would say is that uh, they're scouring far and wide, but they're also, and I like this, they're also working with Lee Darnborough, who actually is. If you look at his the players that he's he's brought into the football club under the the previous regime, given the financial constraints, he's actually done a very good job. And I think mm -hmm. um, going forward, there's it's it's it, it would be very easy to flood the the squad with players from abroad. Um, but there's a balancing act to be had there. And I think um, while I do think they'll, they'll spend money in the summer, I, I don't think it's all about going out and spending four, five, six million pounds or whatever um, on, on, a, on a centre forward. Now, we know Ajun is, is, Ajun is, is very, very pro signing the striker. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Marcus Force was, was turned into a permanent deal. And I actually think mm -hmm. that'd be 
um, a, a good move because he, the guy knows where the back of the net is. And I think given time, um, played in the right system, because obviously, as we touched on just before, sticking him up front on his own and lumping the ball up to him and expecting him to hold it up and bring everybody else into play is, is futile. Um, and you just, you I always thought when he was at Brentford Force that he was um, a wide player. I thought he was one that cut in. Do you know, like a Wilkes or a Kale yeah, I thought be. that's what his role was. Yeah, he can be. What I, what I would say as well, just on that subject, is, um, is I don't know if I'm done from the gun, but having KLP playing at the top of the pitch has made such a difference yesterday. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's funny when you play a striker or an attacking player in the top half of the pitch, what they can do as opposed to playing them left back. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, it, you've got to be careful. There's a balance to be had between bringing players in from abroad. And I think that's what, I think initially... There was a there was a take there was a desire from the new owners to bring or the new owner to bring players in from abroad. Um, thankfully, he he's he's taken on advice from those around him that maybe that isn't the, necessarily the way to go. If you look at the if you look at all the rumours and, and conjecture in, in the final couple of weeks of January window, and actually look at where players came in from, there's only Syed Manesh, um or a liar that, that that came in from abroad and that was always going to happen um, because Adjun raves about him I spoke to him um, the other day and he again telling me how what, how great he is and he's, he expects he expects a lot from, he actually said to me I expect a lot from him there's a lot of pressure on him from me um, and Will we you know, keep him, Mav? Will we keep yeah. him in the summer? We're going to sign him in the summer. We've got an, an option on that. I believe so. Yeah, I believe that um, that that deal is one that will will be completed in the summer. As, you know, I stand to be corrected, and things can change. But as as I, as I understand it, yes, completely. What what's his natural position then? Because obviously we, with him being from you know a, a league abroad, we don't actually know that much about him. So what is his natural position? Do you know much in terms of where he plays? Well, it seems like he can play. He play. He can play off a central striker, but he can also play across across a three. Um, again, like we just touched on, force coming off the flat, coming off the flank. Um, I'm not convinced he's a he's an out and out centre forward per se that you can sit the ball up to him. And I don't see that in him. I see him. Um, you know, I actually think somebody like and he's, he's much maligned, but I really think Tom Eves has had a massive impact since coming back into the team. And definitely, um, and, and whether or not. They go for that type of striker going forward, but Eves, I think, has shown us all an ability to run in behind that not many people thought he had, and um, that ability to, to to drag defenders and take the focus off somebody else. And I think it, 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 um, Elia could actually uh, flourish off, off off Eves, but yeah, I think anywhere in that in that in, coming off the left or the right. Um, but again. You know, like we said earlier on, we're expecting a lad that's never played in this country. And he's still only young to come in and hit the ground running because the team is in struggling, mm. and they, you know, it's score doesn't score goals. So I think, um, you know, you know, it's it's not been easy for him either. And hopefully, when he gets he gets fully fit, we're, you know, there's a there's a, a chance he'll be back involved on Saturday. I wouldn't be surprised if he was on the bench against Albion. Um, yeah. And again, I, mean, he, I think what we saw from him against Derby when he came on for his brief cameo towards the end, I thought he looked quite uh, exciting. Yeah, he looked, you know, he, he, his first thought was, I'm going to try and take this player on. It was forwards, it wasn't backwards, you know. What we kind of got used to seeing for a bit where we, we were quite hesitant to put the ball forwards. He came on and was like trying to flick the ball over defenders' heads and, and stuff like that. He looks quite a maverick mm -hmm. in that sense of things. So I'm quite excited to see him play. Um, I think. In terms of that, then, so if we, we've got West Brom on Saturday, obviously another um, ex City manager, two in a row, we've got Steve Bruce. But I've just had a look at their recent form, and they've only won one in the last 12. And this is a West Brom, one, I think it's one of the they've had a bad time. best in the league. Um, so it's quite bizarre to see them playing so poorly. I think their last win was a 3 0 win against Peterborough a month ago, over a month ago, back in January. So, you know, we've, we, it's a good chance, really, to put some more pressure on them and, and, and help pull us away from that back three entirely. Um, what I'll do then, um, do we think, it's in terms of system then, so who, who's back from injury, Baz? Who, who've we got available for Saturday? Uh, so, the, I still think Nathan is 50-50. He's got, uh, he's obviously got a hand injury. There was some, that was all a bit strange at the start of it. It was illness and then it's, miraculously, it was a hand injury. But we know he's got a hand injury. Um uh, and last week in training, he was still getting some discomfort uh, when he was catching the ball, which is pretty important for a goalkeeper, obviously. So um, I, I suspect that he will be back 
for West Brom, but whether he's he, he won't start the game, that's obvious. Um, and North yeah, Jersey, lost, obviously, Matt, Matt Ingram's done fantastically well. Tom Eves should be back, Alaya should be back. Um, you'd expect Louis Coyle to be in and around it, but I've got to be truthful. Probably, I, I, can, I can see Eves and, and Alaya getting on the bench. I don't, I don't see him changing too much in the starting 11. Um, but he was he was like a kid at Christmas last night talking about having players back and, and you know because he's, he's been really struggling he's, he's had you know yesterday we got eight players out you know so um I think the majority of them are going to be back obviously we we know we can't talk about Josh Emmanuel at the minute um that's one that we, we hope that the club are in a position to comment on um in the near future uh, and, and and Louis Coyle obviously is 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 out for uh, until the end of next month. So, but I think apart from, unless I've missed anybody, um, I think we're I think we should be back to those two aside, pretty much full strength from the weekend. Yeah, I, I keep forgetting about Emmanuel. I mean, when you look at the current system we're playing, I do think that we've missed a trick not being able to use him as a right wing back. Because I think that mm -hmm. role made for him. Oh, uh, how good he was last season. Yeah, he's he's, he's brilliant. It's a, it's a, it's a genuine tragedy that he's been, he's been struck down with with illness over the last few months because you look at the you look at when Louis Coyle got injured at Barnsley um and you thought what not that that's straight in there and then obviously it, it didn't happen and I think you feel for him because he's such a he's such a talent um and you just wish him the very best yeah I mean um hopefully we see something positive uh come out from the club for him quite soon because I do think that um, we've definitely missed not being able to use him on that right hand side, especially in Coyle's absence, like we say, gives us another option on the right, right wing back kind of side of things. Um, so, um, Will, I know we've not, we've, we've kind of, <laughs> we've, we've, we've kind of hogged bads this episode, haven't we? So, when it comes to West Brom, then, um, given their recent form and given um, our nice convincing win over Peterborough, um, what are we expecting from West Brom? Would you take a point or are we going for the win there? I mean, with it being the KC, I'd definitely be going for the win in bad form we're on the back of a decent result players should be up for it I would be, I would take a point now but I would be hoping that we're going all out for free mm. do you think do you think he's going to keep the same system or do we think he's going to change it up personally because how well they played I try and keep the same team I know I've got all these players coming back I'd maybe make some changes on the bench but I don't think anyone can really come off that can be taken out with that performance and put straight back in, out with the side. Personally, I yeah, I, I think yeah. everyone played well enough that they deserve to play again against West Brom. Yeah. Um, back three then, Nathaniel, because instead of it was all just predicting the starting eleven, there's quite a few of us. Do uh, Deshaun Bernard obviously um, had a little foray in right back previously, but um, was was out for Alfie Jones against. Uh, Peterborough, do you think, in terms of options at the minute, or the, or especially the team that played against Peterborough, do we think that Slater's maybe going to have that right wing spot again, uh, and which leaves Alfie Jones to go into midfield and Bernard to come back in? Um, I mean, I, I don't really know. I'm glad I don't have to choose. I, I, yeah. I keep Slater there, uh, and you can't drop Greaves or McLaughlin, McLaughlin really, but I thought you couldn't drop Bernard. So... I think Bernard maybe was after playing right back. Maybe he was just being rested because um, that's you know a, a difficult position to play, especially for a centre back. Maybe you're not used to running up and down the wing. So um, I mean, I don't really mind. I think Jones has been really good since he's come back in. I think um, like some players this season, like Fleming, we've sort of forgotten how good Jones had been for us. So uh, you wouldn't change it. I think Bernard was unlucky to not play, but I keep Jones in there uh, in defence, I guess. And uh, um, it was good to have Doherty back in the midfield because, um, you know, he, he, he was a huge part. Uh, you know, he's always maybe the top three players uh, in every game last season. So I think it's good to have him back. He looked more like his usual self than he when he came. Yeah, on. I think he's just needed that rest. Um, yeah. But I just keep the same back three, you know. It's a it was a very good win, and um, uh, West Brom are there for the taking, definitely. I think. <laughs> did we did we enjoy doing one over uh, Grant McCann, John, or was you a little bit uh, a little yeah. bit hesitant? To, to, to I, think, uh, I think Steve Bruce next week will get a better reception than Grant McCann got yesterday. Mm. 
I was yeah. actually expecting, I actually expected him to get a quite a good reception yesterday, and they, they were giving him absolute belters. I was, I was surprised, surprised, how surprised how bad it was. It's, I don't know, it's just fun, isn't it? It's just fun. It's, you know, it's a reason to, you know, yeah. do a different chant. Why not? See, I've, I've had, I was having a few talks with some Peterborough fans on Twitter, and it's, it's interesting because Grant McCann's time with us was so, I don't know, explosive. Oh, right. Like, there, there, was no, there was no middle ground with McCann. It was either we were absolutely terrible or we won the title. So mm. there's, it's really, really hard to get sort of a general feeling on the fan base of Grant McCann because obviously the, the achievement of winning our first league title in 55 years, which, you know, a lot of teams, you look at Sundle and look at Ipswich, they're still down there struggling. It's it's a big achievement. It but then there is also the last year, though. Yeah, it? but then there's also the other side of the coin where we got, what, 15 points from, from over 35 games or something and that really bad relegation and the 8-0 against Wigan and then, you know, the poor run of form this season before stumbling upon the three at the back stubbornness to change the system so uh, it's, it's a really tough one with McCann because I think whilst he sort of demanded respect in some way when I was watching <laughs> when I saw the goals go in I couldn't help but feel really really overjoyous about it I don't know why because I actually wanted him to stay to the end of the season personally just to sort of see the transition out um but no it, it, it did it did feel good it was a bit it was a bit strange but um, think, like you say I think Steve Bruce will get a better reception but uh, what, what's it like for your perspective then Pat? Oh, so good. Come on, John. So I was just going to say, I think COVID helped McCann really because it did. The first half of it, where we were the worst one of all time, it, it we would have it have been. I mean, we'd have just destroyed him. He would have been in a job in League One yeah. if the fans had been there for the end of that season. And would that would would we have the kind of League One for him is unfortunate because it's like the lost season. There's only like I mean, I don't think Baz, you could even go, could you at the time? But like because we just watch it on telly, it wasn't like it was real in a way. Like, it did feel know. weird. So, yeah. but would we and would the fans would have been on his back? I mean, the fans were on his back. After, I mean, I think we'd won the first six games and then we lost to Fleetwood, I think, didn't we? Oh my God, the, oh, the yeah. backlash from that was just unbelievable. We'd won the first five games or something. I was like, whoa, everyone needs to calm down. And I think that was ready <laughs> to happen in that season all the way through. So I, think I totally noticed awesome. similar, I felt the similar that on Tuesday night against the team that Sean went on be named. The way that people were, I, I had people saying, bring back Grant. Well, I, I, I just said that jokingly, and then of course, I actually uh, we beat him 3 0. I think we should put the McCann debate after today to bed, unless we get relegated, yeah. perhaps, because we've beaten his team 3 0 with a new manager. That's that's all we need to know. Move on. <laughs> yes. I think. I mean, I, I think they've essentially recruited for League One there, personally. I think, I I think possibly. I think possibly dead and buried, and they've, it's they've a, got it's him an in obvious. Because, it's an obvious appointment for Peter to make, but it is still strange that they've had Ferguson three times and McCann twice now. And, mm. and, and you know, McCann does well with a good squad, but not very good with a bad one. Their squad's worse since January. So I think um, it's tough. I think it's tough for Peter, but without trying to sound disrespectful, they are they're, they're, they're quite a small club. And uh, be disrespectful. Of, <laughs> in terms of their, 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 their budget and whatnot and what, what, they're able to sort of, I don't know, attract to the club in terms of management might not be sort of, you know, the same pool as, as, as ourselves, for example. I think that the likes of Darren Ferguson and Grant McCann know exactly what the club's about and it's easy for them to come into that and it's easy for the club to ask them to come back, you know, without trying to sort of break the bank. And I mean, I mean to be fair, Mark Hughes has just gone to Bradford to, you know, maybe, maybe it just takes a bit of, of, of convincing sometimes, but... Um, I just think that they've gone for the easy option. He won the title in League One last season, so it would be an easy one to sort of get the fans back on side. They know him. They know what he's about. Potentially go back for a promotion next season. But from reading their Twitter, they're not very happy with the squad of players that they've got whatsoever. They're, 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 um, they're wanting a bit of a summer exodus, I think, of that, that club. <laughs> so we'll see what they do next season. But back on to Hull, because it is a Hull City podcast. Um, so uh, West Brom uh, on Saturday. John, what? Do you, do, you, do you think if Coyle is available then, do we think we'll see him deployed in a wing-back position or a four at the back? No, no, I think he'll, I think he'll keep it the same as he did for Peterborough, injuries permitting. I think the players that played in that game deserve it. And then we'll see which Hull City turns up. You, you, you never quite know at the moment. But, but no, I won't, I won't put Coyle back in now. And I, I don't think actually, from his hamstring, it's quite quick, isn't it, anyway? He won't be back until the end of next month. 
Yeah, so I'd keep it as it was. Slater, Slater played well. He deserves yeah, his place. Yeah, he's too early. Tyler Smith mm. played well. He deserves his place. Keep the players that they did well and see what they do this week as well. I'll yeah. take a point. I do, I'll, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I like, yeah, I like Regan Slater. I, I, I don't know because he seems he seems to me. I don't know if you guys agree. I think he seems better this season than he was for his last. Um, mm, which is odd more... because he's not played as well for Sheffield United. Yeah, so he's only really played in the under twenty threes. I suppose that's kept his match sharpness. He just loves this club so much. <laughs> but we 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 kind of used him in the smallwood role last season, didn't we? So maybe we didn't see that mm -hmm. um, forward thinking side of him that we've seen this season, where he's got a bit more freedom to go do what he wants to do. But I, I think, especially for the, the sum that we paid for him, he's an absolute steal, and he's going to be amazing for us in the future. It, it, the likes of him and um, Sean McLaughlin and Brandon Fleming that have just come in and sort of epitomised. Um, sort of consistency and effort at the minute I think is just key to anything that we do well uh, and I think that Sean McLaughlin especially is probably going to because if you had to pick like, like out of the the four defense center halves that we've got at our disposal like which one you would sort of I mean that'd be a good bench a uh, start bench drop question probably for, for, the, for the three of our center halves yeah. because it's it's so tough in it because like the, the Greaves uh, even Bernard Jones the McLaughlin they've all been brilliant um comes uh come summer then baz um obviously i I, mean, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about this or not but Ajahn did say that he's got um a, a big announcement coming up do you know no, what we can't spoil it we can't spoil it yeah, most crazy thing in football don't say anything baz don't say anything don't say it out even if you know <laughs> my lips are firmly sealed on that on that um thing but yeah it's going to be an exciting summer isn't it i think when you look at uh the, the, the out of contract players like we touched on at the top of the show what what they do with them uh you know there's, there's some stuff about the stadium that's going to you know come out in the next couple of weeks um there's a lot there's a lot going on and will be going on uh, but just touching back to to west brom i i think it's another one of those games that that actually really suits City um, because, again, all the expectation and all the pressure will be on West Brom. Like we, we touched on just a moment ago with their wretched form, really. But let's be fair, Bruce has not had the impact that I think many thought or hoped that he would at, at West Brom. And they're a poor side. I, I remember the game at, at the Hawthorns back in the, 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 the first week of, of November. And I was chatting with with Joe, who's the my counterpart at, at the Birmingham Mail. And... He was saying that you know that things aren't going great. This was under Valerian Ishmael, and if if, if Albion aren't, aren't in front in the first twenty minutes, then expect the crowd to get edgy and frustrated and, and, and potentially boo them off at half time. And and duly enough, it was nil nil at half time, and they were booed off, true to form. And I I thought they were really poor. And but for one really really sloppy lapse in concentration, City come away from that with a nil nil, and for me, get a, a deserved point. But where City have struggled this season is when the expectation, if you like, is upon them. And that was the case uh, on Tuesday night against Derby. We, we wrote it in the preview on, on Monday before the game that, you know, we'll find out a bit about City tonight because at, at Sheffield United and at QPR and even to an extent against Fulham, nobody gave them a, a prayer of getting anything. Um, so they could afford to sit back and, and be compact and try and get something on the break. But against Barnes, the expectation was on them to come out and and dominate and, and, and grab the initiative, if you like. And they couldn't do that. Again, against West Brom, I think everybody, given West Brom's budget, the squad they've got, et cetera, et cetera, will expect West Brom to, to come and dominate. And I think that will suit Shotter and City down to the ground because they'll be able to sit in, be compact, um, be well-organised, hopefully, uh, and then catch West Brom on, on, on the break. And that will that will benefit. I can't see him making any changes to the, the, the side, but... You know he needs to find. He's got to find continuity in selection, and I think if he's gonna, if if we're gonna start looking up up the table and, and move away from the, the bottom four or five as we hope to do, I think continuity in, continuity in selection is key. Mm. I've basically I mean, waffled there trying to avoid answering the summer question. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect you to answer the first question, so don't worry. Um, I think yeah, West Brom's a weird one because, like we say, realistically they've got one of the strongest squads in the league. I would say, um, and. We saw how well Ishmael did with, with Barnsley last season and, and the style of play that he does maybe doesn't suit the more ageing, slower West Brom side that he's got. Mm -hmm. in terms you, you hit the nail on, you've, you've, you've nailed it there. 
they're an aging squad. Yeah. So yeah, they're, 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 they're coming to the end of their cycle um, and they need they need an overhaul. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not convinced that Bruce is the, the right guy to, to to instigate that kind of change. I don't think he is. But they tried to do that with Ishmael, but it just it was just it, it was doomed to failure, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's looking increasingly like they're going to be a championship night side next season, and it, w- it will be interesting to see how um, how how we muster up against them in in the three at the back system. Because I think we we were still playing the four three three when we went to the Hawthorns, weren't we? Mm-hmm. That was before the set of injuries where we changed it up. And like we say, we played really well, came away with a loss because of you know a bad result. But um, I, I think, given especially with the performance against Peterborough, that this current system and the crop of players that we've got on the pitch and the enthusiasm they've got on Fleming, who's doing assists left, right, and centre at the minute. I think we can really hurt them, and um, it really be, it will be really interesting to see because I think also Caleb P's head will be right up now after that brace. I think he'll be um, he'll be on fire now for the next couple of games, if I was to guess. Because like we say, strikers live off confidence, don't they? It'd be nice to see Tyler Smith bag another one because um, it's been weird because I defended Tyler Smith for absolutely ages on this podcast, and I said I really like what I see from him. I really like how he tries to get in behind. He's on the shoulder of defenders. And then when he missed that one-on-one against Barnsley, I was done. I was like, no, I, I, that's it, was, it now. It was I'm bad. Tyler Smith. Really? And then he came on. He was a bad miss. He was. Keeper saved it. He did yeah. 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 it. One-on-one Don't on the worry, Puzzle. I gave him, I've given him the stick about it already. Yeah, the whole half of the pitch to himself. But I, I'm really glad he, he did get the goal against Peter. Yeah, he Pickers. narrowed his own angle down with how wide he went. He could have squared it Maybe. to KLP too. Um, but we don't, we're not talking about that. Well, we're not, yeah, we're not talking about that. That game didn't exist. So I, it will be nice to see him sort of, you know, kick on and maybe find some form. Because I do, like you said, Baz, I do think there's a player in there and it would be interesting to see how well he does. Because um, I do like them kind of players where they're, they're forever. Because he's quite a small lad, but he muscles himself about on them defenders and gets in behind mm-hmm. and he makes a bit of a nuisance of himself. And I, I, I like the look of that um, style of player when, when you're a striker. Um, so hopefully... He can kick on. Sorry, the dog is trying to get involved in the podcast. <laughs> but um, I think personally, well, we'll do score predictions actually. Yeah, um, John, I'll come to you first. What score do you think? Um, I don't. So I mean, I don't know which whole city is going to turn up. One all, and I'll take that after after Saturday as well. Mm-hmm. Just keep getting that. Uh, Will? 2 0 City. Okay. Nathaniel? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't think we're very good at home, and West Brom are terrible away, and they can't score. So I think I might go 0 <laughs> 0. Yeah, I could see that one coming. Uh, what about you, Baz? What are we reckon? I'm, going, I'm, 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 go- I'm not going to be there, unfortunately. I've, I'm, um, I'm ashamed to say, but I, uh, I'm going for a 2 1 City win. Positive. We like it. Eat your frosties. Remember that. Remember them. You know, I had, I've not said anything, but I did have a. I'd run out and I, I went to the, the <laughs> shop on Friday and, and bought a kilo a kilo box and had a massive bowl yesterday morning and thought, come on, we need to do this. And it <laughs> works. You're not getting married again on Saturday. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when Baz don't eat his frosties, we don't win. So you know to tag relentlessly when we are, lose. Are you off to watch uh, Forest Beach if you're naked, Baz? <laughs> Uh, no, unfortunately, I'm going to. I, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to Singapore on Wednesday for a week. Um, oh, for a week. unfortunately, it's, it's a work. It's a work trip. I'm I'm being sent there, so um, I'll, I'll be hopefully listening in from wherever we are on Saturday. I mean, the, the time difference is a bit substantial over there, but hopefully, I'll be. I certainly will be following the result, and I'll I'll endeavour to. I've got a little, um, you know, like the mini mini box of frosties. Over and variety packs. Yeah, right. yeah. But I got. Yes. I, funny enough, I got because the, the the frosties joke. One of my one of my missus friends um, got me for Christmas the the frosties bowl with a, you've probably seen it like Debenhams and places like that. The, the gift that those. Yeah. Gifts, uh, I got the frosties bowl with the handle, the, the spoon, and a box of frosties inside it. Um, so I shall take. I've, I've been keeping the box of frosties back, so I shall take it with me. In me, I shall pack that in me in my bag on the, in the suitcase to travel on. on so I go on Wednesday, so um, yeah, I should be. I shall. I shall be having. I should be having my frosties. Done a panic. 
<laughs> that's gonna be it. Frost is anonymous oh, in the summer. <laughs> it's become, trust me, honestly, you think it's become a thing on social media, it's become a thing in my house as well. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you were getting an email from Baz asking for um, asking for you to be like a rep doing some sort of branding for us. I do like posters, yes. Please supply me with, with a lifetime supply of posters. <laughs> I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't promote like self sponsorship, but I, I, I am here if, if Kellogg's want to talk. Other cereals are available, of course. Yeah, yeah but they're not as good. We'll see him. The, the Luton game, Baz will have a Frosty's hoodie on when he's doing his post match video. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to come to dressed as Toby the Tiger. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense, thing. yeah. I'll fight the Rory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, charity boxing match. Baz in the. Uh, Frosty's tiger outfit against Rory. He was when I went into the when I went to the, to the ground the other day. He was the the the, the, um, the mask outfit was all set up on the wall. I got to chuckle to myself. It was quite. It looked a bit surreal because there's just this big tiger head just sat on the shelf, and it looked quite like imposing and almost like he was going to come and get you. Did I tell you a secret. <laughs> Got a secret to tell you. He, well, he's well, Amber, John's Amber is actually a man. <laughs> Ah, well, it's 2022. These yeah. you can accept things like that. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. It's a nice yeah, I'm not bothered by that. <laughs> How dare we come on here and reveal <laughs> secrets like that? <laughs> not, as, not as good as the uh, um, one of uh, or the summer uh, one. But still. I've got another secret. Uh, they're not real tigers. Oh. Oh, well, that's that then. I feel like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a note to end on there. I know. I'm sorry. That's the end on that mic drops there. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we'd be doing um, any of the listeners an injustice if we didn't ask John about his South, South Stand chanting. Because. Uh, oh. Um, give us a song. Like, <laughs> it's a bit of a highlight. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to do a song. I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to. I'd, I'd hit. I've re- I mean, you can if you want. Feel free. <laughs> but uh, you can song, say no. Have... You can't. Yeah, you can. You can't. Yeah. Have you got a favourite? Yeah. Now, do you do it every single game? Now then. No. Well, no. I've retired now. Once, once, um, once Ajun came in, I said you don't need me anymore. But I just felt like this beginning of the season. What it was really at first, it was because. All we did was sing, uh, we go wild, wild, wild about 20 times a game. So yeah. I was like, why didn't we sing about players? So that was on Twitter. And then people started singing me songs. I just sing, so I started singing. And then no one joined in, obviously, because it's a self stand. <laughs> and then every time I walked in, like everyone around me was like, what are you singing today? So I was like, oh my God. Well, I can <laughs> tell you, I was going to say, John, I sit in E2, or stand, I should say. And I've definitely heard a lot of those songs suddenly appear now. Which is good. We yeah. we needed more. We needed more songs about players. That was the whole point. We, we just didn't have any songs about players, and they deserved the songs, especially after winning the title. So, mm. so mission accomplished. I've retired. I'm just singing, singing out without the camera now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I personally yeah. enjoyed it. I sat in the south stand for the Swansea game, and um, I kept an eye out for you. I couldn't see you, but then I heard you chanting and spotted you. You were just behind <laughs> me up at the beginning. I, I joined oh. in. We are trying to help. <laughs> um, but in, ter- in terms of that then John what is your favourite chant at the minute my favourite chant at the minute oh god see I like I like the Doherty chant when we've got that going I think that's a good one actually um, the who's that we do yeah we don't sing enough but at the minute I, I think we should get it going every single week because I think it brings everyone together as the South Stand where the East Stand Tigers I think that I think that gets everyone going a bit you know and that was I feel that now and I felt that like yesterday like the last time I went away was under the Alums and there was always that undercurrent of kind of anger and it just wasn't there. And we're just waiting for it to lift off again. I feel that. And and I think, you know... Uh, yeah, the feeling, been, the feeling since there. the Black Bang game has yeah. just been... Yeah, I didn't... Miss, uh, again, John, I think you make a great point. The away fans yesterday, I thought, were, um, were really, really good right from the get-go. And obviously it helps when your team's winning 3-0 and playing really, really yeah. well <laughs> against uh, uh, Grant McCann. But I thought... There's, there's there's definitely a, a change in atmosphere since the takeover, and I think that I think everybody that's been to it to a, to a home game or an away game or both over that period would 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 you know would be lying if they said it, they, they couldn't tell there was a difference. There's a there's a there's a okay the, the the B game on Tuesday night slightly different, but even before kickoff there was a there was a vibrancy around the place, and yeah. um, in that Blackburn game was you know that that was pretty special there, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it that's the thing we missed. For, that was the thing we missed for so long. When it was the, the fan base being unified and all together, and 
one of the yeah. worst parts parts of the, the previous regime was that we seemed fractured and, and infighting and, and everything like that, but that's changed now. And cause cause I remember when I was cause that's the thing in it, when you're trying to bring fans back, especially now when like, you know, energy prices are going up so much and you're trying to re- trying to convince fans to spend a lot of money to come and watch City, you know, quite regularly, especially with memberships and stuff like that. That when I was a kid, what used to make me want to keep coming back and, and, and made me commit to coming to see football as an adult was how much I enjoyed the match day experience. And now that that's back, that's only going to bode well for the future. And, and in terms of adding, convincing people to come back and buy memberships and whatnot, is re-engaging with the families and the children. And because like we say, like the East stand at the moment seems, seems to always be packed. Uh, but the South stand, when I, especially when I went against Swansea, was, was, was quite empty compared to the rest of the stadium. And obviously the South stand is the family stand. So that I think probably by physical evidence proves where the recruiting needs to happen because I think in terms of like the East stand and, and lower West to some to some extent, I know that <laughs> the upper West is going to open soon to a lot of people's uh, joy. Um, but to, <laughs> to how we see, we, we yet to see. Um, but in terms of, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll actually ask you now, Baz, how, how big a challenge do you think Adjun's got in terms of actually bringing back quite a lot of the fans, especially considering how much more expensive life is at the minute? I think he's got. I think it's a real big challenge. I think it's potentially bigger than what they thought. Um, Gates is steadily increasing. If you look at the home attendances over, since the Blackburn game, they have been on the rise. And I think in any other industry, with that percentage of, of uptake, you'd be quite happy. Uh, the difficulty is because of the apathy of, of the fan base over the last four, five, six, seven years. Because of the the alarms, adding the fact that. You know the COVID pandemic and the, the the cost of living squeeze that we're all feeling, and given the the, the craziness that he's doing over there in in Putin, that's only going to get worse. So there is a a real challenge. But I th- it, w- the good thing is that Ajun is acutely aware of it. He's not blind to it. He wants the ground full. Um, maybe his aspirations in the short term are a bit higher than what the reality of the piece is probably is, is going to be. Um, but it's about re-engaging the community, re-engaging all these all these sort of corporate bollocks words that you know that um, we hear all the time. But it's true that it is about re-engaging the the fans that have, that have found other things to do on a Saturday afternoon, the, the fans that have found other things to spend their their money on, and ticket incentives are part of it. Obviously, we, you probably saw the story in the week that it, the Luton game is going to be that is going to be a ticket offer and for the first time I think since the Tottenham game in the Premier League is, is the, the the upper tier is going to be open and you know for all those that crow about the upper tier now's the opportunity to prove it's yeah. worth opening because ultimately you aren't going to open it if, if 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 the demand isn't there because it costs an awful lot of money to have that that bit open um now there's, there's going to be a lot of stuff over the next few weeks months as we head head towards the summer months of stadium sorting things out and this that and the other and you know season ticket stroke membership whatever you want to call it he wants that ground he wants you know more people coming in and and he will try his damnedest to, to do that whether that's incentives of and i'm speculating so i'm speculating here because i know some pe- other people outside of this will, will will probably take my words and spin it into a story but um you know whether it, whether it's giving free season tickets out to under sixes or under nines or whatever you know there will be things that he tries to do to try and encourage you know the whole spectrum of support to come back and he it is going to be tough because you know we've all only got a certain amount of money you know and and we've all you know for those of us that that have been unable to go to football over the last 18 months two years that money has been allocated somewhere else it might have been allocated to paying the gas bill you know um so it's, a, it's it's going to take time and maybe some of us thought it was going to happen quicker than it probably has done. Um, you know, let's hope the looting game is, a, is another example um, of, of the crowd starting to, 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 to come back and get back into the, the, the habit of of coming to watch Hull City again. And I think, unfortunately, you can't, nights like Tuesday night, done her, done her out, do they? Because you've got 16,000 people in the ground and they, t- they turn out a performance as dull as that. And that's just, but that's football. And I think what I would say is if people are that fickle that they come and they, 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 they come hoping to see 30 win 7 nil and play champagne football to decide whether they're going to come back or not, is it, you know, they're probably not the long-term supporters that you want at your football club. This is no. something 
it needs to be sustainable it needs to be people that are going to come back it needs to be what Tam said to me the other day it needs to be organic if we give away ten thousand free tickets and we've got twenty five thousand people in the ground for the first game yeah fantastic in isolation but that's not organic that's not genuine that's fake those people aren't going to come back week on week we need to it's about progression it's about building that attendance that's sustainable over week after week after week and that's what they're trying to do um and i think that is slowly what we're seeing i think as well we've got to be realistic in the fact that we never had a full we've never had a full stadium in the championship unless we we're literally going for like the title winning game we've, we've never had that we our average, our average on a normal championship season is about 16, 17,000 max. And it yeah. always was. We only get to 20,000 when it's really the closing stages and we're looking at we're going up. So if we can, we're about, we're about to 14, weren't we now? If we could just get another couple of thousand to 16, you know, Barnes didn't bring anybody. But usually, no. like some of these championship clubs, they bring 2,000. If, you, if you've got 16,000 City fans and 2,000 away fans, 18,000, that's a, that's yeah, that is it's good. a good attendance for our football club, and it always has been. For the championship, but, that's definitely fine. Like even in the yeah, Premier I think, League, I know it was Al era. We we didn't have twenty thousand in the stadium at most points last time we were in the Premier League. So sixteen is is very good. I think we've gone yeah. up. For, I mean, how many did we have against Blackpool? I keep going back to like in August, and I think there was about nine thousand home fans. We've gone up to about yeah. fourteen. That's that's quite a big increase. And that's yeah, what is. and that's the point. That's the point, yeah. John. Is that when you actually look, take out the away fans because the, the, you've obviously had some big away following so far this season, uh, and there will be you know a couple more between now and the end of the season. You think you look at the final day and you think, depending on whether you know what that game means to to, to City and Forest, that could be a, you know a, a significant attendance. And um, but the, the crowd is 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 developing nicely. I think it is organic, it is natural, um, and I think if you can get to 16 17 thousand towards the end of the season which isn't unreasonable unrealistic um you know the looting game is is, is, the, is the next one we're looking at away from west brom in terms of the ticket the ticket offer that the the, the the west stand up are being open hopefully that that will encourage people more people to come back but it, it's gonna it, it is only going to happen over time and um you know like i say you, you also have to bear in mind that people have other priorities now and it's so difficult that football something has to give and unfortunately because of covid it's given it's given f football's created a problem and that's well football's had a problem created i should say and it's going to take time but the, this, the early signs are positive and you know ultimately the club realize it the club get it and they know they've got to work hard to get fans back in back involved yeah. mm, trust. i mean i personally think that they're doing everything right i i, mm -hmm. I in terms of match day experience because what brings people back is at least enjoying the day if, if, yeah. if your team's going to lose if you at least yeah enjoyed your day out then it's okay i mean i took my daughter to her first ever game and it was um you know they, they were doing free face painting they did uh they were doing balloons that they had that and they before really hard, Adrian, you, know. you have to give them credit they work really hard to, to try and make match days an experience the best possible yeah and she loved it she wants to go back I, I, mm, I, good. I can, i'm not i'm not taking her back while it's this cold i'll probably take her to a couple when it's that warm up because you were freezing by the end of the game mm. but it's Fair uh, but like <laughs> but the thing is is like obviously everyone's match day experience is different so like when i used to go uh with my family and that it was it was pub before during the game and then you go to the pub after as well so it's, <laughs> it's it, what you going for is different things you, en you obviously enjoy the different aspects of it but um i mean to, I, I think once you get the families back and you get that sort of re-engagement with the next generation of fans coming through then we start to see gradual improvements and because i think the biggest problem at the minute is there's a lot of fans that are going or from what I've seen in like, I know you, you'll know more than me, Will, because you sit in, in, in E2. Would you agree that the, the majority of the fans around you are, are, are younger? They're like late teens. So like, still what they remember, yeah, they're mostly probably younger than me. Yeah, so it's like what they remember in terms of the club when they were kids was we were a very successful side seeing bigger crowds and stuff. So that's why they expect, you know, sort of them sort of crowds again because the, the, the perspective is different kind of thing. They, they, they didn't witness the... The, the transition from Boothry to the KCOM. Because if you think about it, the KCOM crowds were very coincidental in the way that we sort of new stadium bounce. You know, a lot of fans wanted to go watch us at the new stadium, which then coincided with double back-to-back uh, -back promotion to the championship. And then, you know, the likes of Leeds back on the fixture list and then promotion to the Premier League. So it sort of had People that steady incline. So we're probably... You are. People trusted where we were going at that point. Like People yeah. trusted Adam Pearson was pushing us forward. We were a progressive club. And that's why people went because they bought into it. 
Yeah. And exactly. Ellen, unfortunately, people bought out of it. It's going to take time for them to buy into it again. But like, obviously, I've got a nine-year-old. So at the beginning of the season, he's going, why? you know, we didn't score for six hours or something. Why are we coming? Why are we coming? I said, just wait. Because when it gets good, you'll love it. And the Blackburn game, he was like, this is why we're coming. Because he loved it. Because all of a sudden, yeah. he bounced back. And I see a lot of his mates and, you know, and like when I was a kid, you know, like I was, there was about four of us in our, my school at Sporting City. We just got bombasted. We, we had our city coats on with Pallada on, you know. And then as he went into Premier League, all these lads that used to take the mickey out of us were coming to City. Like, yeah. You know, and I can see his I'm mates jumpers. To talk about it. Yeah. His mates are starting to talk again. They're like talking to the parents about coming. And that's the way to go. And that's what we need to do. We need to, people need to buy in to the, the uh, Ajun story. And, and I think they will. But it will take time, as Bass said. And that's the thing. We've just got one thing we're not as as as, as people and, and, and certainly football fans is patient. We have no patience. We want everything done yesterday. And and he's the same <laughs> Ajun is the same. He wants everything done yesterday. Hence why it became a I know it became a long running joke, um, both on social media and, and, and also internally as well about the, the 40 hour thing. But that's because he was he he wants everything done quickly. He, he isn't the sort of person that will stand on ceremony and be prepared to wait. He wants it now, 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 and that has its that has its benefits, but also has its its drawbacks as well. And I think you know he's he, he's going to have to understand that th certain things take a bit longer than he he would perhaps would like, and maybe as as as, as experienced in other in his other businesses. But you know the guy, what you can't take away, you know, and look. There's going to be issues. There's going to be things he gets wrong. Um, there's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. And there's you know whatever else, everything else in between. But what you can't deny in this in this fella is his passion and his desire to be successful at Hull City. And um, he's buying into the he's buying into the city, the culture, the um, and he wants to make the football club a success. He's not buying the football club to you know I've seen it mentioned to to you know to boost his ego or to boost his profile back in Turkey. You know that. He doesn't, with respect, he doesn't need to do that. Um, you know, so I don't I think, think you'd be buying Hull City either if you want to boost your own. Well, there's, <laughs> your there's own that, you're buying Fenerbahce. There's yeah. That, yeah, there's that side of it as well. But I genuinely think that the guy wants to be successful and he wants to be, he, he's fallen in love with the football club and, and the supporters and the area. And the, you know, you speak to him and he, he, he's, he's enthusiastic and he gets it, you know. Um, and, and so, it's going to be interesting to see what what plays out over time, but I, I, I genuinely hope that the city, um, as, it, as it is and, and continues to do, you know, comes out and backs him because, you know, he, he wants to make Hull City AFC the, the forefront of, of of the community in East Yorkshire, and it's it's a huge catchment area up there, as you know, um, and he wants he wants to tap into that, and I think it's going to take time, but he's certainly got the he's certainly got the ideas and. Again, some will, some some of his ideas will will probably go. Hmm, I'm not sure about that. And some of his ideas will go. Yeah, I like that. And some of them will work, and some of them won't. And you know, um, but he's, 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 he's certainly he's certainly there. He's certainly got the, yeah. the the ambition and the passion. I think the difference is that, and what where the alarms went wrong is is that he seems to value the opinion of the fans rather than, you know, this is my idea. I'm going to do it kind of thing. He genuinely seems like he he wants to find out that what he's doing is correct before he does it. He's, he's he, only he's showing like he, fake cares. Yeah, it's like he looks into what the fans are talking about and what they want and things like that um, and then thinks, oh, actually, yeah, how can I improve that kind of thing? Like, Obviously, you can see from himself when he when he was look, coming to buy the club and talking to Ehab and stuff at the stadium that the attendance was down. So that will have already been a priority kind of thing. But then when he's finding out about like how to boost the profile of the club and um, encourage, you know, sort of, get some more interest in it like when he was wearing the whole city shirt at, um the the basketball game in america which is just crazy uh like things like that he's doing it in a way that that shows that he respects the fans values the fans uh, and that there is probably going to be the most important aspect of his tenure as, as hull city owner mm -hmm. is that he, he he does care about what the fans want to do and does it in sort of for the fans on their behalf like he wants to do the best for them rather than just for himself obviously um and that's going to be exciting because like we say that that there then brings that like, unification across you know the players the fans the owner when everyone's moving in the same direction that's where everything happens that's where everything gets better mm -hmm. <laughs> look back at adam uh the adam pierce and peter taylor era phil brown and um duffin uh it's that 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 trust and that 
sort of belief has to be there to, to make it successful. And I think, I mean, you know, maybe see how the rest of the season goes out and then see what the pricing structure is like next season. And then we can probably start looking at regular increases next season. Because I think a lot of people are holding off because they're trying to figure out how much it's going to be and stuff like that. Because obviously you can't change it this season. It's already embedded. Uh, and you can only do a certain few promotions. Of, is it two or three a season where you can change it? Um, so he's got to sort of pick and choose them. Four. Um, is it you, four? Can, you can do four offer games a season. But yeah, look, he, we all need the summer. I think we all need to get through to the summer and, and take stock of where we're at and uh, both on the pitch and off the pitch. And there's going to be a lot of change over the summer. Um, again, both on and off it. Um, but it's just what, what's really nice is to see that the club's enthused, the fan base is enthused by you know, people are smiling again. People are enjoying um, coming to watch coming to watch the team. And okay, there's been you know already in the in the seven games that Shota's been in charge, there's been a couple of shockers. But for the most part, pe fans are coming and enjoying what they're seeing. And the team, you know, this is a really nice bunch of lads. They they they're committed. Uh, what I, it's just a real shame, like, without wishing to labour that point, that fans weren't there to see this team last season. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we can debate all day long about would it have been the same with fans there and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But the fact of the matter is that they, they, you know, it's a real shame that the fans didn't get to see a team that won the championship and um, and and played in a, in a real real nice brand of football. But they're a hard work, hard working group of players. This these and they they, they they genuinely care. And I think as fans, that's all we ever want is that the players that go out and represent our team in our badge that give you know work their knackers off. And yeah, it's not always they're not always going to win the game. Of course they're not. But at least you can say at the end of the game they've come off and given their all. And I think you know I hope that that's something he harnesses going forward into the summer when he does bring players in um, and invariably players on bigger contracts. Um, that he looks and it, it, he said he will that he will look after the players he's got but keep that team spirit because that team spirit is something special they've got there and um, it needs to be harnessed and not it not hurt you know yeah I agree I mean I think it's just exciting times isn't it I mean look we've got West Brom on Saturday another win there and then the mood's totally you know the band the, the, the previous game's totally forgotten isn't it so uh, two wins on <laughs> the bounce has been... very nice yeah, what, what game? game yeah exactly oh, jinx. The, yeah what game but we, we did we did well, didn't we? Unbeaten, uh, Sheffield United, QPR and, and Peterborough playing well. Yes. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what we do against West Brom. Another win would be nice. Six points from the last two games and, and, and significant distance between us and the bottom three would, would certainly help to ease through the rest of the season into the summer and then hopefully we can see everything better next season. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining me because I think um, this is probably going to be one of our longest episodes. I didn't even realise how long we've been online for. Um, well, well, if anyone's well, still with us. Yeah listening at the end of this one um but obviously uh cheers for joining me john uh we're finally getting you on uh probably look to get you on again at some point um enjoyed having you on uh cheers again baz for coming on uh always nice to have you on me yeah no worries and cheers again will and nathaniel uh, obviously um every we, we have got a weekly newsletter now that you can subscribe to so if you've not done that so far you can do so through the link tree as well everything pretty much is on the link tree that you need from us uh, and the the podcast shirts are still 35 pounds that's not including the postage and packaging but uh seven pound 50 of each sale go see andy's man club charity as you'll have already seen um like i said um hopefully i'll be wearing we'll be wearing ours by the next episode i would imagine uh hopefully coming on time um so yeah thanks everybody for joining me thanks everybody for listening uh do get in touch if there's anybody that you want on or if you want to hear john sing again um, we'll get him onto a karaoke episode or something. <laughs> and we'll keep an eye out for Baz's Kellogg sponsorship. Uh, but cheers again for joining in. We'll see you later. Take care. Bro.